So, welcome to my talk, DNI Pro, a scientific breakthrough made visible. My name is Dietmar Ottenweiler and I'm from the headquarters of Rodenstock in Munich and I'm responsible for research and development and strategic marketing. So actually, I'm really happy to present you this topic because DNI Pro is a technology that fascinates me both from a technological side, but as well also from the results that we received uh, from our customers. And you know, for someone coming from R&D, this is something really special. And uh, hopefully after this hour uh, of this uh, lecture, uh, you will also be as fascinated as I am with this topic. So. Let's have a look. Um, I mean, DNI Pro, uh, that's a concept uh, for better vision. And actually, this concept is embedded in something that we call our islands technology. And uh, what we do at Rodenstock, uh, you know, we are always thinking in concepts and we're really thinking in pillars that build on each other. So the entire islands technology started in 2011 when we introduced our I model. By the way, the basis that we could do that was the introduction of the first individual lenses of the impression family from Rodenstock in the year 2000. And uh, we continuously build on uh, that and uh, developed uh, it further. So in 2011, we were able to introduce iModel. And iModel basically had two components. One, that uh, where we could consider and where we could compensate the uh, geometrical optical effects that caused near astigmatism as well uh, as a physiological effect uh, which we call the listings law for near. And I will go into a bit more detail in the course of this talk to give you or to show you the relevance uh, of these uh, uh, very important mechanisms in order to have perfect vision with spectacle lenses for astigmatic uh, uh, spectacle wearers also in the near vision part. Then the second part of that was the personal eye model. And that was something we called personal eye model simply because it's something you can neither describe uh, with the geometrical optical models, neither with standard physiological models, but where we, you need an individual near refraction. But the good thing is, uh, if you do an individual near refraction, then actually with these lenses that include this personal eye model concept, you can compensate then for an astigmatic accommodation, which occurs time by time in specific patients. And therefore, the result is an again improved near vision. So these were actually the two pillars we started with when it was all about the islands technology. And then in the year 2012, we actually uh, came up with a new technology called DNI. And DNI is all about uh, taking into account not only the low order aberrations uh, of the eye, but also taking into account the high order aberrations of the eye, the individual pupil size in order to create best and sharpest vision. Uh, it will be important uh, during that talk uh, that we all have the same understanding what taking into account compensating means because uh, one statement I would like to do upfront with a spectacle lens you're not able to fully compensate high order operations but you're able to take them into account and how this will work. We will see that in the course of the talk. Now the topic, uh, the main topic, but of course of today's uh, presentation will be DNI Pro, a technology that we introduced uh, uh, in 2018. And this is really a groundbreaking new technology. Uh, and why? Simply because for us as lens manufacturer, it completely changed the way that we are calculating spectacle lenses because basically we removed all standard eye models that have been used in ophthalmic industries for the last more than the last uh, 100 years and we replaced it with an individual model of the patient's eye. So we can now also take into account the individual anatomy of the eye, use that for calculation and uh, I will show you in detail during the course of this presentation what it means, why this effect then again leads to a significant improvement in sharper vision. But let's start, as I said before, about the eye model. So compensation of the near effective uh, astigmatism is a geometrical optical effect. And basically why we need to do that is quite simple. So if you have an astigmatic eye and you compensate that with a toric lens, basically 
uh, if that has a full uh, compensation uh, for far vision. Actually, if you go to near vision, then uh, this lens will not fully compensate the astigmatism simply because due to the finite objective uh, distance you do have different uh, angles uh, of your rays uh, uh, that uh, form the image or in terms of wavefront you have different wavefront curvatures due to the finite object distance and therefore you need in principle add another cylindrical component in order to have the full cylindrical compensation for the astigmatic eye when it comes to near vision. And that what it was all about, you know, when it was correcting a geometrical optical effect. However, as I said before, there are also physiological effects and one physiological effect uh, is the so-called uh, compensation of the listings law, both for far and for near vision. As listings law was known for well, a relative quite long of time, um, there was not really always a clear distinction between f f uh, listings law for far as well as for near vision. So basically the listings law for far vision describes the torsional, the rotational movement of the eye when you make gaze movements. And as you can see in this animation, basically when you make gaze directions for the distance vision, the eyes basically the rotational movements are in parallel. However, if we go to near vision, you know, the eyes are converging and uh, if you would apply the same physiological model to that, you would see that uh, you would have then tilted image planes and as you could imagine for an astigmatic eye that would additionally uh, introduce a cylindrical component where binocular vision would be distorted. Therefore, it is clear that if you would like to compensate now this, uh, astigmatic, com uh, this astigmatic component for near vision, you need to find another description and that's actually done by using the, uh, the listings law for near. And you see Mother Nature has created a mechanism that the rotational mechanism of the eye is different if you go into the conversion process during near vision. And therefore, we also need to include that into our spectacle lens. So basically the eye model, what's it all about is the compensation of the effects uh, of astigmatic uh, uh, errors that are introduced during near vision. And as, uh, as I said at the very beginning, these two things, as I just mentioned, uh, they, you can actually uh, compensate them without uh, doing any additional measurements. However, if you have patients that also have an astigmatic accommodation, you can do that with personal eye model and then you can even compensate inside the lens for a astigmatic accommodation. And uh, that all sounds pretty straightforward. However, uh, as a background, I mean, it needed several years in order to achieve uh, uh, that we were able to put different cylindrical prescriptions in the far region as well as in the near part of a progressive lens, simply because you also need to very carefully think about how in the intermediate distances you have this transition from one cylinder axis to the other and then obviously you also need to correctly put it into the lens which both are topics that are not really trivial to do. So that was it all about uh, when it came uh, to the compensation of near astigmatism, something that really helped us uh, improving the lives of uh, progressive lens wearers in the near part. But now we we'll come to different topics. Another thing uh, that uh, also hinders progressive lenses and spectacle lenses in general from being perfect is that the eyes has imperfections that uh, are really hard to correct uh, with spectacle lenses. And these are the aberrations, not only the low order aberrations, but also the high order aberrations. And as we will go now through the description of this process, uh, we will see, uh, of course, and that's something trivial, um, that uh, these aberrations depend on the pupil size. And the first statement I would like to make, that's really the easiest one, that obviously the pupil size depends on the lightning condition. However, there is also a physiological dependency of the pupil size uh, um, on the accommodation process. We all know if we focus to near, we are in the so-called near triad, which causes uh, the eyes to converge, as we just discussed for the eye model. 
However, we also have a uh, pupil constriction when we look uh, into the near part and therefore um, it's important to understand that if you're a progressive lens user, if you still have rest accommodation, then the pupil size actually will alter depending on which part of the lens you're looking through. If we then look at the eye um, and we are talking about aberrations, uh, uh, let me just introduce one concept and that's the concept of wavefront and we really clearly need to understand what this concept is all about. So basically wavefront description uh, is, uh, is nothing new, it's simply in physics a different way of describing how light propagates. You can either have a ray description or you can have a wavefront description when you're talking about imaging properties of optical systems in general. And uh, basically one can say um, if uh, for the ideal eye light parses uh, uh, the eye in form of the wavefront, the ideal eye means there are no aberrations present and uh, basically then uh, an object point is perfectly imaged to a point on the retina and then the wavefront uh, is a flat plane and this is what we typically see you know when we look at wavefront plots that if there is a uniform color a uniform distribution that means that this is a wavefront or an optical system that has no aberrations at all. However we all know that the human eye always has some kind of uh, imperfections and so when the light uh, is passing the eye, is imaged to the retina, then we'll have aberrations. And this is what you see here with this animation. If you have an imperfect imaging property of the eye, then you will have these color maps uh, that we typically show at the entrance pupil of the eye. And the result, and that's basically the description of the result, that the imperfect eye will then result in a blurred image of the retina. Now, the description uh, of these uh, aberrations and the wavefronts, they are typically done with so-called Zernike polynomials. So Zernike polynomials are simply a mathematical way of describing wavefronts, the form, the geometrical form of wavefronts in a circular system. Why a circular system? Because we have a circular pupil and then you have an uh, what we call in physics or in mathematics uh, an orthonormal system consisting of these Zernike polynomials and these polynomials, this difference, they do have a coefficient that describe the strength of each and every different shape uh, of these deviations from the ideal wave, waveform. And as we can see here, there can be made a general uh, distinction between so-called low order aberrations. That's what we typically know from compensating with spectacle lenses. It's the spherical defocus, it's the astigmatism and the prism. However, an optical system also has other aberrations, the so-called high order aberrations. And I think we are all aware of the aberrations that we call tree fall, coma, spherical aberrations. And they actually, even if you have the perfect uh, compensation for astigmatism and spherical refractive error, still lead to a bit of an unsharp image uh, in each and every optical system that has these aberrations. However, the role and the effect uh, of these aberrations, uh, they vary significantly. Uh, and uh, this is shown here in a graph that shows the result here of a meter study um, where uh, this research group here, um, they have uh, actually gathered uh, several studies where these different uh, Zernike uh, coefficients have been studied and uh, quantified. And uh, I would now really like to concentrate on the spherical aberration simply because that's the aberration as we can see here in the red box that is most significantly different from zero. So it has a coefficient of 0.05 micrometer, but as we can also see, there is quite a deviation, a standard deviation coming with it. Even the different studies had the different means. And if you then go to different individuals, that also means uh, that uh, this spherical uh, aberration could have significantly different values. And, uh, that's important to understand because the common and the most textbook knowledge about it is that the spherical aberration is an aberration that always leads to a night myopic shift if the pupil increases in low light level conditions. However, 
if we have a look at it in a bit more detail, we see that it's not as easy as I just described. The myopic shift uh, is uh, clearly visible if we go really to the mean. If you go to a large uh, set of population, then you see that the mean is around 0.051 uh, uh, micrometer. And, uh, when you make a refraction with a pupil size of uh, two millimeters uh, and uh, uh, then you go into the low light conditions, the pupil opens and you will end up uh, and then the res as a result, you know, with this kind of, uh, of uh, spherical aberration, you will end up with a shift in the uh, spherical uh, refraction actually of nearly half a diopter of the 0.48 diopters. So that's basically what you expect and that's what people think of night myopic shift that occurs in humans. However, as we see uh, that uh, the strength of this spherical aberration might be significantly different, we also find uh, individuals that might exhibit a much higher or a much larger shift, uh, myopic shift uh, uh, coming along with it, as in the upper line, up to uh, 1.2 uh, diopters of night myopia. But let's have a look at the lines below. So what you saw from this uh, data of this study, you will also find individuals where this coefficient is not positive but negative. And if we go to the lower line, if you have, for example, a, co a coefficient for the spherical aberration uh, for the individual eye for minus 0 uh, 0 0.079, you can see what happens is that if you make a refraction for a small pupil, two millimeters, and then uh, you have low light conditions, uh, the pupil opens to six millimeters and suddenly the refraction changes about 0.23 diopter to a hyperopic shift. And that's something I think is, 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 is very striking. And this is a good example for explaining the need that we in individually need to consider the strength and the size of the spherical aberration. Because if you would simply make a global uh, compensation for a myopic night uh, shift when the pupil opens, it would be definitely going into the opposite direction than an individual would need. And it would be definitely wrong for an individual that exhibits a night hyperopia in contrast to a night myopia. And that this is not only a theoretical exercise that I'm talking about. I would simply give you here an example. That's actually the refractive state of one of the engineers that was involved in developing DNI Pro. And you can see here that the prescription uh, for, uh, for, the, uh, for FAR, for the photopic, um, when you compare it to the prescription in the mesopic states, uh, exhibits a uh, shift of 0.13 diopters when going from uh, a small pupil to a high pupil. So even in our small R&D team, we do have examples for night hyperopia. Now, let's sum it up. Uh, this was all about the aberrations of the eye. And I think it's important that we at this stage uh, uh, recapitulate what has been said so far. So basically, it's important to state that with spectacle lenses, we can only compensate the low order aberration, aberrations, meaning prism, defocus, and astigmatism. And this is important to state because uh, more than 10 years ago, there have been lenses on the market that claimed to co fully compensate high order aberrations measured by a magic device called aberrometer, and that now then patients would have uh, supervision, eagle eye vision. However, this is not true, simply because uh, with spectacle lenses, we always need to be aware. We do not have a centered optical system, but fortunately we can use spectacles also for gaze movements. And therefore we have a decentered optical system in most cases. And if you would make this compensation for all high order aberrations that you can measure with an aberrometer soon, as you would make a gaze movement, then um, your vision would be even worse rather than without a compensation. That's important to note, high order operations cannot be corrected, but what we can do, we can actually try 
to understand their influence on the best possible spherical cylindrical corrections. And that's what we do actually with DNI because we know the different pupil sizes because the device we use for measuring uh, the aberrations as I said before, it's called an aberrometric device, and in our case, it's the DNI scanner 2 that we use for that. We have that exact mapping of the aberrations of the eye to very high precision. Then we also map the pupil sizes, and then actually, when we have uh, the physiology behind it, when we know for certain parts of the lens that are used for different distances in order to use it, then we can actually uh, compensate for the influence of these high order aberrations of the best possible spherical cylindrical correction that we put into the lens. And that is what we do with DNI. And uh, as I said, mostly um, you will see the difference when you go to low light conditions, because then, uh, of course, these effects uh, will be. Uh, most visible and will have the largest effect. However, it's all about also a bit of a general comfort that you have with it simply because it's the most precise way of describing the refractive state of the eye. And this generally, of course, also leads to an improvement uh, on, on this. So what we do is we use your subjective refraction, take the objective refraction and then point by point in the lens use then or calculate the best spherical cylindrical refraction that is suitable for the object distance that this certain point in the lens is intended for. And that's what it's all about when we talk DNI, something uh, that uh, again uh, received a very, very good uh, reception from our customers. And uh, at that point, actually, of course, uh, we made studies about the physiology. I mean, theory is one thing, but we also need to be sure that this lens also performs in daily life. And that's why, of course, we at R&D did a lot of internal studies. We also did some external studies. However, it's also important uh, uh, that you get external feedback. So a lot of customers from us, they also made studies. And this lens was really evaluated significantly better than what we have seen before with all lenses on the market. However, the question arose, OK, if we are at this stage, is there anything better to come? Can we still improve something? Because uh, that was, I remember, in the year 2012, a lot of people approached me, said, hey, I really had a fantastic customer feedback from the, my customers where I did the DNI uh, lenses. But uh, do you have anything else to come? So we asked our, ourselves the question, well, what could actually be another point where we could introduce a significant improvement into the lens? And that's what it is. Visual impairments are not a disease, but can be remedied very easily if you understand the system of vision in its entirety. The eye, one of the most complex sensory organs in the body. Since the beginning of ophthalmology, people have been trying their best to understand it in order to correct visual impairments. In 1900, the Swedish doctor Alva Gullstrand succeeded in taking a decisive step. Through his research, he managed to develop a general model of the human eye. The so-called Gullstrand's eye was born. From then on, the physiological structure of the eye could be included in the calculation of lenses. Technology and lenses were gradually perfected over time. But one thing remained the same. Gullstrand's eye as a standard basis of calculation. We asked ourselves, is a 118-year-old standard still relevant today? In 2018, Rodenstorff broke through this frontier and is in the process of rewriting the textbooks. For the first time in the history of ophthalmology, Rodenstorff largely dominates the vision system. Gullstrand is being replaced. With the DNI Pro technology, Rodenstock measures the individual anatomy of the eye and is the only manufacturer in the world who also transfers these measured values to the lens. The result 
the sharpest lenses ever, and thus the sharpest vision of all time, thanks to DNI Pro. That's what we came up then, DNI Pro, the sharpest lens ever. And now let's have a closer detail on what that means. And uh, I would really like to introduce this topic uh, with uh, the thoughts actually I had when uh, coming into this industry 16 years ago when I joined the R&D team in, at Rosenstock. Uh, because, you know, I came from technical optics as well as from physiology. However, you know, when you come from technical optics, uh, you're used to calculating optical system basically in a very straightforward way. So you're thinking about which object distance you would like to image. Then you exactly know where your image plane is. It's typically a sensor of a camera. And then what you do is you either take the rays or you take the wavefront, which as I said before are equivalent descriptions. And then you have a look at the refractive surfaces that the light needs to path from the object to the imaging plane. And then basically you calculate for each and every refractive surface the effect uh, uh, on the ray or on the wavefront curvatures. That's what that was the world I was used to. However, then coming to ophthalmic optics, I wondered, well, it looked a bit different here. And why? Simply because uh, we didn't know too much about our uh, detector system, the human eye. It was all described by so-called reduced eye models. And the most known of that is the Gullstrand eye model. So basically, uh, as a lens manufacturer, uh, you were not really interested in what actually happened in the individual eye, but you could rather see it as a black box. So no matter how the individual eye looked like, no matter how the anatomy of the eye is, basically we always thought there is the same eye sitting behind the lens. And you know, I always wondered how that could work and why we shouldn't do it different. And everybody told me, well, Dietmar, that's the way we need to do because anything else would be too complicated. And that was then the approach uh, that we followed, that we said, hey, somehow we need to overcome that and find a way and actually to clearly and individually describe the eye with all of its refractive, main refractive parts that it has and then go for the, for the calculation that is the gold standard for all optical systems, take in an object point, image it through all refractive surfaces until we are at the object plane, the retina. And that's what, it's, what the DNI Pro basically is all about. Now, but before uh, coming to that, let me say some words on the uh, reduced eye models on the Gullstrand eye, because there was another aspect uh, to it, uh, or there are several aspects to it, uh, which are really important. So first of all, let me state uh, that uh, uh, if you have a closer look at that, that was part of my confusion at the very beginning, per definition, the standard eye models and the Gullstrand eye model in particular they are all a model based on an, on an amotropic eye. So you can imagine if we, I mean, when we do correction with spectacle lenses, we do talk about amotropic eyes, not about amotropic eyes. So you can see that this model somehow uh, does not fit from the very principle. And therefore, that's another argument for the need of changing that. But then when it uh, came closer, you know, I was uh, a bit cautious because I said, okay, Gullstrand is, uh, uh, is, is a well-renowned uh, physiologist. Uh, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in uh, 1911. So I said, wow, uh, now removing such a highly respected and qualified person from, uh, from the way we calculate the lenses, oh, that might be a bit tricky. However, as I'm both a physicist and a physiologist, my heart as a physicist then knew that it's right. And why? Because just as a side anecdote, it was uh, Albert Gullstrand who actually refused Albert Einstein to get the Nobel Prize for Relativity Theory because he didn't believe in that. Uh, and the Nobel Prize for Albert Einstein then needed to be uh, on the photoelectric effect. Uh, that's the way the other colleagues in the Nobel Prize Committee came around that. But 
uh, Guldstrand was always refusing Albert Einstein to be uh, a Nobel Prize winner. And therefore, in my deepest heart, I do not regret, but I'm really happy to have replaced the old Guldstrand I model. And it was also described in all textbooks that these reduced eye models might not be the best solution for calculating spectacle lenses. Uh, it simply was technically too complex. And it was known and it, therefore it really took quite a while until we could go to the market with the product uh, that actually now uh, has a complete different way of calculating the lens. Now, as I said, the eye uh, is not a standard eye. Typically, uh, we need to really see that each eye is individual, is different, and that the eye length can actually vary up to 10 millimeters. And uh, if we have a closer look at that, you see even if you have an amotropic eye uh, that has uh, no refractive error, then we even here, we can have uh, differences uh, of nearly up to 10 millimeters in eye length. So the eye length is actually uh, the most uh, significant part uh, of the anatomical uh, differences that individual eyes can exhibit. We also see differences in other parts, but definitely the eye length is uh, the most important one. And therefore we decided to include the eye length into our calculation to build an individual uh, eye that includes the differences in eye length. And uh, what we do is actually we measure with the, with the device, as I mentioned before, the DNI scanner 2 that we have. We cannot only measure the refractive state of the eye, but we also can measure the contribution of the cornea. We can measure the, uh, the anterior chamber dimensions, so we exactly know where, uh, where the crystalline lens sits. And this information is actually together with the uh, precise information about the refractive state, then uh, we can measure actually, or then we can, sorry, we can calculate the, the eye length to a high precision. Uh, and that's what we do in order to build this individual eye for each and every patient that we measure with the DNI scanner. And uh, this is important here to see uh, the correlation. If you do a direct uh, uh, axial length measurements with a standard lens biometer, as we have done here, the comparisons with the lens star from Hagstride shows you that uh, the way we do it by taking the corneal uh, power, by taking the anterior chamber uh, dimensions, and the refractive state into account gives us really a very good correlation with the real length of the eye. So I think it's fair to say that we have a very precise description of the individual eyes in terms of anatomy. Now let's have a look what that all means for correction with a spectacle lens. And you know when we first introduced the concept uh, uh, there were some people coming and saying hey Dipmer, that's a nice concept however if we do a subjective refraction no matter how long the eye is, uh, I mean, we will already have that included in the way of choosing the best trial lens and therefore the best spherical cylindrical correction. Yes, that's correct. Because uh, if we have a look here at this, uh, uh, this slide here, you can see, yes, with the trial lens and the subjective uh, statement, okay, here the image is sharpest. Obviously, this uh, already includes the different lengths of the eye. However, we should also be aware that uh, uh, we do not have a perfect image on the retina because mostly we have a, uh, what we call a circle of least confusion on the retina simply because uh, our optical systems, both the tri lenses but as well as also the optical system of the eye, as we discussed before, they not only have the lower order aberrations that you can correct with trial lenses or with spectacle lenses, but they also introduce high order aberrations and therefore it's not a perfect point imaging, but you have what you call that circle of least confusion. And that's basically what you see in the subjective refraction. Whenever the circle of least confusion is minimal, then you say it's the best possible correction that you get with a subjective refraction. Now, uh, if we just uh, look then, basically, uh, of course, then if we go into a, uh, a lens order, this trial lens then somehow needs to be described. And a lens uh, is always quite easily described by its focal point. And per definition in ophthalmic optics, we call this focal point of the trial lens the far point of the eye. And so we as a lens manufacturer, 
we have on a first glance a quite simple task simply because we only need to match uh, our spectacle lens with a with a tri lens so meaning we basically need to produce a spectacle lens with the same far point than actually uh, and the same focal point that the tri lens had however as i said before fortunately a spectacle lens cannot only be used uh, in one gaze direction like you do that with trine lenses but you can use it for gaze movements and therefore of course we need to assure uh, that these uh, optical properties are also hit uh, when it comes to gaze movements so basically we need to rotate the eye uh, by the optical eye rotation uh, center and that's the center where all fixation lines are set to intersect and if you rotate uh, something around a fixed point with a given distance, then you all know what will you, you will result and you will end up in a sphere. And therefore, the far point then extends to a far point sphere. Now for a spectacle lens, um, uh, and that's what I said, as a spectacle lens manufacturers, we always were aware, um, since there is this black box behind, uh, you know, where we're talking about this far point sphere, there's no need to calculate so far, simply because whenever you have the uh, requisite that you need to have a focus on the far point sphere, it's equivalent to look at a sphere that's hitting the back of the lens, the back vertex, and that's the so-called back vertex sphere. So basically it's the sphere uh, touching uh, the back vertex of the lens, again rotated about the optical eye rotation center. And uh, that's how industry does it. Whenever you calculate the lens properties, basically you calculate the lens properties at that back vertex sphere. And why is that sufficient? Simply because it's equivalent to having the focus on the far point sphere. And as long as or as soon as you know the convergence of the ray bundles or equivalently described as the curvatures of the wavefronts, uh, then you actually have an equivalent dis description and it's sufficient to really describe everything, all lens properties on this back vertex sphere. However, if you have a closer look at that, the first problem already occurs when you look at physiology. And that's again a good example for you should not only have a look at the physics, but you should also have a look at the physiology. Because the human eye unfortunately does not have this optical eye rotation center. It has a mechanical eye rotation center which is distinctly different from the optical eye rotation center. And therefore you see this model already poses significant problems for describing the best possible spectacle lens. And there is another thing coming in. And therefore, let's have a look what it means then for correction with spectacle lenses. So as we said before, uh, that's the same situation we just had a look at uh, with the tri lens. If you have best uh, uh, correction uh, for far vision through the center of the lens, then uh, the image on the retina will be the circle, least, the circle of least confusion, and that's uh, the maximum we can get there. So basically, all's fine. Uh, the spectacle lens has uh, its focal point on the far point sphere, and for the eye, that works fine. Because that's what you have uh, as a result from the subjective refraction. However, if we make gaze movements, everything changes. And why? Typically with gaze movements, we look at different object distances. So we do have different accommodative states of the eye, meaning we do have a change in pupil size. We then associated have a change in high order aberrations. We do have a change in the influence of the high order aberrations on the best possible uh, spherical cylindrical refraction. And that means, although the spectacle lens you know, remember it was calculated to still have the focal point here on the far point sphere, even for, uh, for oblique uh, incidents. However, if you then look at the retina, there is no more a guarantee that the circle of least confusion is actually then hitting the retina. And that's what it's all about. So you see, this is now uh, the point where, where we say, hey, due to using a standard model, how we did in the past, will lead to, a, to an imperfection in the spectacle lens whenever you make gaze direction with the spectacle lens. And this can only be compensated by the exact knowledge 
of the individual eye dimensions. So basically what we need to do with DNI Pro and what we do with DNI Pro, we no more rely on the spectacle lens uh, uh, that needs to focus on the far point sphere uh, in all, uh, all gaze uh, directions. However, we actually have now the retina as uh, being the relevant measure for a spectacle lens to image sharply. And uh, this is, uh, as we know, the, uh, the individual lengths of the eye. This is now independent of the individual length of the eye for, uh, for the user, for the patient. Uh, and uh, therefore, we can always guarantee that the calculation we do is actually leading to the best possible focus on the retina. And uh, therefore, and uh, that's important to note, when you look in the old picture, then suddenly these lenses, they do not focus on the far point sphere anymore, but they will deviate from what was known in the past to be the optimum. But remember again, the new standard is the retina and not a theoretical model of Goldstrand's eye. And that's the basic principle of DNI Pro, what we do. Of course, there's a lot more mathematics and physics behind it, but uh, I hope that this explanation shows the relevance of using the individual eye anatomy for the perfect calculation of the lens. Now let's have a look at a second aspect, and that's, uh, you all know, for progressive lenses. We always uh, need to make sure that what we call the lens designs meaning the distribution of the fields of vision and the reduced uh, and, and, and our aim to reduce the aberration parts of the lens, that this also is in accordance with what we do. So therefore, let's have a look at three different consumers. They all have the same amyotropia. So basically, if you do the subtractive refraction, same result for all the three of them. But remember, they probably have, do have different individual eyes. However, in the old world, what we do is uh, we get the refraction, we calculate the lens based on this reduced eye model data. And uh, so all of these three patients get the same lens design. So basically the grinding of the lens is the same for all the three of, of them. And unfortunately, what happens on the retina is that they will experience completely different progressive lens designs. And why? The reason for that is that, uh, as it's indicated here, only uh, our patient in the middle that has approximately a standard eye uh, experiences the lens design as we intended the lens design to be. But if you are unfortunate and you have a bit of a longer eye or you have a bit of a shorter eye, then suddenly also all the visual fields, the astigmatic errors completely look different rather than to what we expected it to be. So therefore, uh, this also not only leads to a, or this is not only a matter of sharp vision uh, in central vision, but it also affects the quality of progressive lenses. However, now when we come to DNI Pro and look at the same customers with the same amyotropias, we now know the different geometries of the eye. We know the different lengths of the eye, and now we can individually alter the lens such that you know the lens might be different from the grinding for each of them. However, and that's the important part, the image on the retina is the same. So now we can also guarantee that uh, no matter what the anatomy of the eye is, each customer will have the same experience of the lens design than we actually as the lens manufacturer, you know, with all our physiological, physiological studies have intended uh, the lens design to be. That's important to note because uh, this was also one of the sources of incompatibilities or rejections with progressive lenses simply because of the individual anatomy of the eye. And uh, of course, uh, you could now say, okay, Dietmar, that's all good theory, a lot of physics around it, a bit of physiology, but was there anyone around seeing a difference? And I can tell you, yes. Uh, I mean, again, we made uh, intensive uh, studies at, at R&D, but there were also a lot of studies done with universities. They were scientifically published. So there were also independent scientific studies uh, that proved uh, that the wearers were significantly more satisfied with these lenses. And that's 
finally the ultimate uh, proof and also test for us that these lenses do work in practice. Because no matter what theory we have uh, uh, at R&D labs, the ultimate test is always if you are using the lenses, if you get the customer feedback, and that's the thing that counts. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, uh, it's not only an aspect uh, of uh, better vision, it's not only an aspect of uh, having the, the, the positive feedback, but it also, it's also an aspect of commercial success. And I just have included here uh, some data from uh, Bernie Zaccaria. Uh, so uh, whenever you know we have customers switching to DNI Pro, uh, this will always result also in really commercial, positive commercial impact on the business, simply because you do have uh, satisfied customers, it spreads the word, and uh, this is something, you know, uh, that we are also very aware of. Whatever we do, it should not be an academic uh, lesson that we do. But finally, as I said before, we need satisfied customers. We need set, uh, customers that value what you have done for them by uh, providing a good lens. And for you, it should also be a factor where you can improve your commercial success for your personal business. Okay, let's sum it up. The Rodenstock's unique islands technology consists of several pillars. I mean, we have gone through uh, uh, the pillars of islands technology, DNI, DNI Pro. However, I would refer uh, a little bit more back because I uh, stated at the very beginning, uh, basically all started in the year 2000 with uh, what we call at that time the individual lens technology, ILT which basically was the first individual lens uh, that was sold worldwide. Uh, and this has all to do that we could optimize the lens, uh, the spherical cylindrical optimization. We could consider the position of wear, the individual position of wear for the wearer. And this is really the basis and foundation of all we could, could do later. What we did later on then, you know, we could also consider the individual lifestyle. So that was something, you know, uh, where we could uh, actually offer different designs depending on the lifestyle of the user. And the idea is always to have less perceivable swimming effects simply by shifting the aberrations that are naturally given. That's a physical law and no one can actually remove these aberrations. You can only try your best to be at the, phys uh, at the physical limit uh, that gives you um, uh, these aberrations. Uh, but you can put them, uh, these aberrations, into areas of the lens uh, that are not so relevant for the user. And that's what it's all about when we talk about lifestyle uh, designs and, and the way that we actually can choose designs for the wearer. And then finally, it's all about the consideration of the individual physiology, meaning the individual aberrations of the eye, but also the anatomy of the eye. So the eye length, the contribution of the different refractive elements like the cornea um, and the anterior chamber dimensions all determine that. And this really then gives full power to the lens. So you see, it's an entire concept built on different pillars. And uh, what you see here in small gray, I also put it in here, the future. So be sure that we are uh, also working on further steps that will build on what we already have. Because it's important for me to state, I mean, whenever we do our R&D efforts, for us it's so important that all pillars build on each other that you can rely on, then when, whenever you use a technology of uh, Rodenstock, then the next uh, generation that we add will be a natural addition of something, not a replacement. That's a very important message I would like to transport. So this is what it's all about. And uh, uh, of course, uh, the hero is DNI Pro, because that's really a scientific breakthrough. We as Rodenstock, we do calculate now the lenses with DNI Pro in a completely different way than we have done the past 150 years ago. We do it in a completely different way than all other lens manufacturers do. And therefore, now you might uh, understand why I chose uh, the title for this talk, A Scientific Breakthrough Made Visible. 
Let me just uh, uh, add uh, that you might look forward uh, to the coming months. Uh, all the best uh, of the features will be included in one product, Impression Free Sign Pro, that gives you most flexibility. And uh, I personally, since uh, we introduced that product, that's actually my product I wear. And uh, if you put an extra clean on that, uh, I'll, I'm sure whoever uh, will have that product, uh, there will be no way back to another product. Okay, we have FreeSign Pro. So uh, that's basically uh, Rodenstock's unique islands technology. And again, uh, to sum it up, this islands technology as a really the unique and core Rodenstock uh, technology consists of several pillars. The DNI Pro revolutionizes the way spectacle lenses are calculated. It abolishes the more than 100 year old Gullstrand eye model. It's the only lens calculation technology that actually takes into account uh, the, highly precision, uh, the highly precision measurements of the aberrations of the eye as well as the anatomical data. And remember, the device uh, that we use for measuring the uh, uh, refractive errors as well as the autonomy is called the DNI Scanner 2. It's an aberrometer with added topographic unit and it also has a unit, a Scheimflug unit, for uh, measuring the anterior chamber dimensions. It leads to the sharp vi sharpest vision and as I said before, uh, I think the ultimate uh, proof uh, only, always can only be the results uh, and the feedback that we get from our customers. And I have to say I'm really glad and happy that I got so much uh, positive feedback on that. So as complaints would be on my table, I have to f I say so far, fortunately enough, no complaints at all on my table. But, and that's the good thing, and that makes life as an R&D guy really nice. Uh, I did actually get uh, feedback from end consumers. They asked their, uh, their opticians to write an email to Rodenstock uh, to really give the feedback that they never had such a sharp and comfortable vision before. Okay, so, uh, this was uh, what I wanted uh, to talk about today and all what I said today is summed up in this short video which follows. The eye is one of the most complex sensory organs in the body. In 1900 a general model for the eye was developed. However, this model quickly reaches its limits in lens calculation because only if the eye of the spectacle wearer corresponds exactly to this model, the image on the retina is perfect and ideal vision is possible. However, this is rarely the case because every eye is unique and often deviates from the standard eye model. The shape of the cornea, the eye lens, the anterior chamber depth and the length of the eye all vary from one person to the next. If these parameters are not taken into consideration in the lens, the image on the retina is not ideal. As a result, perfect vision is not guaranteed. Thanks to the new DNI Pro technology, Rodenstock is now able to factor in the individual anatomy of the eye in the lens. In addition to the amotropia and pupil movements, the shape of the cornea and the anterior chamber depth, as well as the lens and the length of the eye, are taken into consideration here. Rodenstock is the first manufacturer in the world who also includes these biometric parameters in the lens optimization. The result is the most individual and sharpest Rodenstock lenses ever and thus the sharpest vision for everyone. To sum up, as each eye is unique, the optimization using the eye model is not suitable for everyone but only for those whose eye fits this model. This is changing now. With the DNI Pro technology, everyone obtains their perfect lens and thus ideal vision. Okay, here we are. Thank you very much for your attention and I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thanks a lot.
Hope to see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.